Okay. I think that's everybody. Has everyone got some food and so on? Good. So, welcome to the Washington Institute. My name is Andrew Tabler. I'm the Martin J. Gross Fellow uh, here at the Institute in the program on our politics. Um, and I'm very happy to be here on um, a very, I think, a very special occasion um, to talk a little bit about uh, a subject that's very um, close to my heart and intellectual interest, um, and I think one that actually helps inform uh, policymaking, and that is um, the ins and outs and what have yous of reporting from Syria and Iraq. Um, firsthand reporting uh, on the wars in Syria and Iraq plays a vital role in helping policymakers understand what is happening on the ground and set realistic goals. Such reporting is extremely hard to carry out, however, due to the obvious and far too often tragic reasons of armed conflict and everything that goes along with it. But even in the most peaceful of times, reporting from both countries and the translation of those reports into foreign policy has been burdened by lack of access, um, political manipulation, cliches, and linguistic and cultural misunderstandings. So when I heard that Jonathan Spire was, was coming to town uh, and that I remembered that it was the, uh, that it's Ba'ath Day, it's the 55th anniversary of the seizure of power of the Ba'ath Party in Syria, and that we were talking about Syria and Iraq, I know, bad joke, but um, I thought it was a rare opportunity to talk about an interesting uh, subject. So there's also another reason why, and that is John has just written, um, and what inspired this actually, was um, my review of his uh, excellent book, uh, Days of the Fall, A Reporter's Journey in Syria and the Iraq Wars, a uh, cover of which is to my right. Jonathan provides uh, a rare eyewitness account of how the conflicts have defied uh, expert expectations, eroded state identity, and threatened the wider geostrategic order. Uh, over five years, Jonathan uh, reported from the heart of the wars, spending time in Aleppo, Baghdad, Damascus, Mosul, Idlib, Hasakeh, and other frontline areas. He witnessed some of the most dramatic events of the conflict, the rescue of trapped Yazidis from the attempted ISIS genocide of 2014, the Assad regime's assault on Aleppo, the rise of independent Kurdish power in northeast Syria, uh, the emergence uh, and the emergence of Shia militia in Iraq um, and elsewhere as a key force. So we're just going to make this a conversation. John will give his impressions of reporting from these areas and the conclusions of his book and some ideas of the trajectory of the conflict, and which I will follow with a few comments and questions based on my own experience, um, not only working on here on policy in, in, uh, in Washington, but also um, from the field in Damascus. So Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, uh, thanks to everybody for uh, for coming along. So what I thought I'd do in this uh, initial talk, which I guess will be uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, is the following. First, to try uh, to say a few words about where I think the Syrian conflict is currently at, uh, both in terms of the immediate developments and in terms of the, the general uh, emergent shape of things, uh, and then to, to go on to talk about uh, the issue of reporting and the, the book I've written and, and how I try to... To, uh, to deal with uh, that issue and, uh, and what it's about, and then to say a few words at the end about uh, some lessons I think we can learn from the Syria conflict with regard to media coverage and with regard to, to sort of the state of media coverage, both good and bad, uh, where we're at right now and what Syria has, has taught us about that. To get straight to it then, first of all, uh, I guess just to, to, to note where we're at in terms of the, of the, the Syria conflict today and to, to remember that there are you know, th there's three uh, areas right now under very uh, intense uh, uh, combat and conflict taking place. Obviously, Eastern Ghouta is one, Afrin is another, and the third is the Idlib, Idlib Aleppo countryside, a much less well uh, covered area. And I think if we if, if we think a little bit about those three areas, we can we can take from that and extrapolate from that a lot about where the Syria conflict is currently at. Obviously, in Afrin, uh, the Turkish uh, the Operation Olive Branch launched in, launched on on January 20th. Uh, the Turkish attempt to destroy the uh, the Afrin, uh, the, the Kurdish canton uh, in Afrin, and right now the Turks are, I think I'm right in saying, 10 kilometers from Afrin city, driving forward uh, with very heavy losses, interestingly uh, heavy losses, at least according to uh, Rami Abdul Rahman, the uh, Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, who, whatever one may wish to say about him, is not a PKK partisan, and the figures he's giving are, uh, I looked them up before I... I came here that three he has 366 dead on the Turkish side 
and 327 dead on the YPG side, which is an interesting statistic when you consider the fact that the Turks are pushing forward with armor and artillery and air power, and the YPG are a lightly armed light infantry force. And Rami's figures, by the way, include, he says, 68 Turkish dead, i.e. not Syrian rebel dead on, on, the, on the Operation Olive Branch side. So the Turks are moving forward. Will they enter Afrin city or not? We don't know. But certainly in terms of the future of the Afrin canton, I think everybody can, uh, can conclude that's probably over. In other words, the, the Kurdish controlled area will continue to be in cooperation with the United States east of the Euphrates and a little bit west of the Euphrates, but not as far west as Afrin. Afrin is going to cease to be uh, a Kurdish canton fairly soon, I think. And that tells us something about what's happening in the war, both in terms of the Turkish uh, determination to destroy Afrin, but also the relative security of the Kurds as long as they're working with the Americans and the, and the you know, extreme vulnerability of them as soon as they no longer have that uh, American uh, guarantee, which they have further east, but not in Afrin. Um, with regard to Eastern Ghouta, once again, we can learn a great deal from the fact that, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the, the latest reports indicate that around 50% of the area is now already under uh, regime control. The regime are pushing forward to a place, I think it's called Misrata, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is going to, if they reach it or when they reach it, it's going to cut what remains of the rebellion in Eastern Ghouta in half. Uh, Eastern Ghouta is obviously going down. Eastern Ghouta is over, and Eastern Ghouta is going to face the same fate as Aleppo in late 2016. Uh, we're hearing already that the Russians are proposing the usual arrangement whereby rebels can get onto uh, green buses and uh, and travel with their weaponry up to Idlib province, and that's the end of uh, rebel-controlled eastern Ghouta. And, of course, uh, we're all watching very closely to see what's going to happen next, whether it will be southern Idlib to then suffer the same fate and eventually perhaps also southwest Syria. The gradual uh, rolling up of the uh, of the rebellion, which strategically is now... Uh, into its last stages and facing uh, eclipse. And lastly, the issue of Idlib countryside, which is something quite uh, astonishing, which is that the rebellion, the Sunni Arab uh, rebellion, even as it uh, faces its historical uh, eclipse, uh, is still finding time to uh, to engage in fratricide. That is to say, we have the the war, the war, the war within a war within a war of uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, uh, fighting against uh, Nuruddin Azinki, I think it is, and, and Sukur Asham, you know, this little, uh, you know, internal assigned rebel war taking place. And by the way, hardly covered by international uh, media, but nevertheless, again, the figures I'm taking from Rabbi, Rami Abdul Rahman, for what it's worth, is saying that there's been 233 people killed in that fight in the last month. So this is, again, not a little tiny detail. It's some very major combat taking place among the rebels, even as the regime, you know, waits in southern Idlib to come up and deliver the coup de grace, which at some stage, is, of course, will, uh, will happen. Thus far, then, with regard to the immediate tactical developments uh, uh, in the war, let me say a few words about where I think uh, all this is, uh, is going in the broader strategic uh, sense. Fairly obviously, Syria has been dominated over the last uh, five uh, or six years by two recognizable and distinct uh, conflict systems. One being the uh, one of which gave birth to the other, right? One of which, of course, is the the Assad regime's war against the largely Sunni Arab rebellion against it, and the second in the eastern part of the country is the war of the global coalition against ISIS against the uh, ISIS uh, pseudo caliphate. Both of these conflict systems, in in my estimation, and not only my estimation, I think quite clearly, are currently drawing to a close. Are currently drawing towards decision. They haven't reached the final decision yet, but the direction of events is very clear, namely that the Sunni Arab rebellion, of course, no longer has any hope whatsoever of defeating the regime as, and probably is going to be, is going to, probably not much more will remain of it within the next year or two other than perhaps some isolated, you know, rural uh, countryside areas which will still be on some state of insurgency or another. And the ISIS pseudo-caliphate has, has lost almost all, uh, around 95% of the territory it held in Syria, remains covering ground only in some small remote parts of the lower uh, Euphrates River Valley, and those are going to be wrapped up fairly soon. And ISIS is going to go back to being the insurgent network that it was before it recreated itself as a as a as an entity holding territory back in uh, 2013 slash uh, uh, 2014. These are coming to conclusion, and the and the issue is fairly clear. Um, the question is, what comes next? What's what's coming to replace those two conflict systems? And fascinatingly, I think it, it, what is becoming increasingly clear is that what replaces those two systems is not a return of Syria to uh, repressive but relatively stable governance as it was uh, 
prior to March 15th, 2011, but rather the birth of a whole number of new conflict systems which will be played out on the soil of Syria, but which are not themselves dependent in any way on internal Syrian dynamics or even internal Arab dynamics. If we think of, if we, we list, as I'll do in a moment, the emergent conflicts what's, you know, on Syrian soil, what's fascinating to note is not only do they not primarily involve Syrians in the leadership positions of, of, the, of the protagonists, but also they do not even involve Arabic-speaking players. They involve people from outside of the Arabic-speaking regional space. So if we can think of four... Uh, emergent uh, conflicts. Well, we already talked about Kurds against Turks. That's something which is going to continue one way or another, even after Afrin is gone. Obviously, Erdogan's very clear, first of all, about his desire for Menbij, but secondly, about the, the more broad conception that the Turkish government clearly have, that the emergence of de facto quasi-sovereignty in the hands of what the Turks, in my opinion, accurately uh, characterize as a franchise of the PKK organization on Syrian soil is not acceptable to them and there's a strategic goal on the Turkish part that that should come to an end at some stage and that will find itself played out one way or another even after Afrin falls. Not in my opinion uh, by a Turkish swerve towards Menbij in a military sense because that will I think, be one step too far for Erdogan but certainly in terms of you know the strategic desire that that should come to an end and they'll find they'll be wishing to find ways to help that to happen. Uh, secondly, as a result of that, an emergent, not conflict exactly, but certainly conflict of wills between the Turkish government and the United States of America. That is to say, everything which at least I've been hearing this week here in, uh, in Washington from, from uh, you know, trusted and uh, informed colleagues is that the uh, de facto partnership between the United States of America and uh, the uh, Syrian franchise of the PKK is something that looks to be continuing for, for quite some time. The Americans are not about to up sticks and leave, and for as long as that partnership remains, there will be a conflict of wills between the Turkish government and the United States government, you know, down to a very uh, deep and real level, a real difference of, uh, of desires. And if that does, if, east, if Syria east of the Euphrates, that 28% of Syrian territory, including, as we know, the gas and oil resources and much of the best agricultural land, you know, is going to continue to be effectively a U.S. Uh, uh, possession or a U.S. Uh, uh, project, so to speak, then that is going to, I think, continue to have very serious uh, implications for the Turkish-American uh, relationship. Um, and uh, thirdly, the issue of uh, Israel versus Iran on the uh, over the soil of uh, Syria. We saw the events... Uh, on, I think it was February February 10th, you know, the issue of the drone and then the Israeli attack on uh, Syrian uh, air defences as a result and the loss of the F-16I. This is something which is not over. Israel is watching very, very closely as Iran continues to construct its own uh, project on the soil of southern Syria and indeed not just southern Syria, Syria throughout, uh, including three very important elements, the, the very notable an extensive creation of physical infrastructure on the ground in terms of bases, training bases, administrative bases, bases for, for storing rockets and, and missiles. Secondly, the presence of Iranian proxies in very large numbers, up to around 20,000 uh, people, according to the information that I read, uh, on Syrian soil, longer term, not going home. And thirdly, and perhaps most interestingly, the Iranian project of recruiting and crea creating and, and recruiting for local proxy organizations, the attempt to create a Syrian Hezbollah, so to speak, or a number of different Syrian Hezbollahs. This is all going on. This is all heading west towards Kunetra Crossing. Israel has determined that it should not reach beyond a certain point, and the, and the potential for collision there uh, as a very, very real uh, possibility in the months ahead is, is another very interesting process playing out on Syrian soil. And last but not least, uh, the potential, of course, for American-Russian uh, conflict uh, on the soil of Syria. We all watched closely and with interest, the uh, in incident uh, in Konoko gas field on February 7th, I think it was, 500 men crossing the Euphrates, considerably less than 500 men making the journey back uh, as a result of them uh, doing the, uh, ex the, the supreme folly of seeking to challenge uh, an American military force tactically from you know, head on uh, on the ground. You know, as we were, I was discussing with Andrew earlier on, there are all sorts of things you can do if you wish to oppose the United States and perhaps succeed. But one thing you absolutely should not do is to seek to challenge an American force frontally on the ground in a tactical uh, situation. They did, and they paid the price. And the interesting thing is one assumes that's probably not the last time 
uh, something similar may happen, given that the regime and the Russians very clearly and very badly want the gas uh, and oil uh, capabilities of southern Del Azor, and will seek to acquire those by hook or by crook. Um, my own view, and this is something which I think American friends should be, and I hope you are and presume you are thinking about, is that you know, having attempted to take the issue on head on and paid the price, what the Russians and regime will now be thinking about is, is another style of work which they're pretty good at actually, which will be that of creating networks of political uh, alliance with uh, young men uh, among the Arab tribes of, uh, of Deir Azor with the intention that a few months or six months from now, uh, they will want you to be facing some kind of popular uprising in your illegitimate entity east of the Euphrates, which will come wrapped in the banners of, of Arab identity and Syrian identity and so on and so forth. And I hope very much that you're thinking about that. You should be, because that's something which is coming coming down the road quite soon, uh, I think. Um, thus far then, with regard to where uh, the conflict is going, just to note once again, you know, all of these systems, all of these these new conflict systems being born on the on, on the soil of Syria are ones that are not primarily informed by internal Syrian dynamics. It's a fascinating thing, and not even by internal regional dynamics for the most part. It's foreign powers, you know, taking their uh, or asserting their will on the soil of fragmented Syria as a result of uh, the uh, the near collapse, so to speak, of uh, of the state. I I I, re I make that point again because certainly in Israel, and I presume here also, there's an interesting discussion going on about about what the current direction of events in Syria means. There is a school of thought which says uh, what's happening is that the regime is coming back, right? What's happening is we're on the way to the restoration of the status quo ante bellum of, of March 2011. And I think that's, that's a, you know, a deeply misguided view. There is something coming back which is holding the banner of the regime, so to speak, which has conquered ground and will continue to conquer ground. But this is a very different thing to the regime prior to the war. This is not, in fact, the return of or Syrian Baathi sovereignty, so to speak. It's something quite different. It's de facto domination by Iran of a great swathe of Syria. It's de facto domination by Russia of a great part of Syria. And, you know, and, and that's the meaning of what's, what's returning. Um, let me then turn to, to the issue of uh, now of, uh, of reporting the war and uh, of the, the book I've written, Days of the Fall, about the process of, uh, of reporting the war. Um, my book, as, uh, as, as Andrew uh, noted, is a, is a chronicle, so to speak, of, of, of the trips that I made to Syria and to Iraq in the course of the last five years. And what it is an attempt to do, in a certain sense, is to kind of bookend, uh, start and finish, of a, of a particular period of conflict in Syria. That's to say, in my view, the Syrian war, as we have known it, is coming to an end. There's going to be more war in Syria, but it's going to be different wars. The regime rebel war and the ISIS coalition war, these are coming to an end. And what the book is an attempt to do is really to, I suppose, trace the process of both those conflicts from start to near finish uh, through the, the mechanism of my own uh, reporting uh, trips to the country and through the mechanism of the quite sort of vast or, or quite extensive, at least, uh, body of information from interviews and experiences and, and photographs that I kind of built up over the course of five years. Um, and I think it, I, I, I hope at least that, that we managed to do that. I managed to do that in an interesting way. So we, to briefly just take us through what the, what the various kind of way stations are, so to speak. We start off in the Idlib province in February uh, 2012, and, and where I was one of, the, one of the first people, not the first by any means, but one of the first Western journalists that entered that area. Remember that moment, that strange and precarious moment when the regime had retreated from parts of northern Syria, but it still controlled at that time the border with Turkey, right? It was later on that year when, when they abandoned the border. But at that time, the regime was still on the, on the border. So we had to sort of get through the regime lines on the border in order to reach these, at that time, emergent and precarious uh, rebel-controlled uh, zones in Idlib and Aleppo province. And it was a fascinating thing to, to observe then two things. One was you know the rebellion in northern Syria at a time before the Sunni jihadis uh, came to be dominant within it. And, and that was a time when most of the rebels that you would have met in Sarmin or, or Binish or, or, or uh, Salakib or those, those rural towns in, in Idlib uh, province would have been recent defectors, recent deserters from Assad's army, secular people, many of them still wearing the unit insignia of the regime forces that they had been just recently uh, aligned with. 
uh, and and to, to observe those networks close up was fascinating. I think the lesson one learns from it, at least in my judgment, is that had a different policy from the West been pursued at that moment, it, there was what to work with, and we shouldn't, you know, we should remember that there was what to work with if we'd wanted to have created a force, a non-Sunni jihadi force that could have pushed southwards. Uh, there was what to work with, and the West chose not to work with them, but but they were there. Um, interesting to note that also at that stage, and I observed this as a reporter at the time, uh, the Salafi jihadis were already there in Idlib, even at that early stage. Those networks were visible. You could meet them. You could see them. It was a different group of people to the, the ones I just mentioned, but they were there uh, from the start. They ended up, of course, dominating the affair. At that stage, they were not dominant. And I, I go in the book then into Aleppo, my own reporting in Aleppo, when the rebellion burst into Aleppo, of course, in August and September of that year, and the kind of high point, retrospectively, of the rebellion's achievement, you know, when things looked very close to uh, a rebel victory, and many of us thought that was the way it was going. And uh, witnessing then some of the early manifestations of the unsurprising, you know, pure uh, ruthlessness of the regime in its, in its determination to... To stay, uh, to stay in power. People here will probably be familiar with the name of uh, the Dal Shifa Hospital in uh, the Shah neighborhood of, uh, of uh, eastern Aleppo. And I was one of the people who witnessed the early uh, manifestations of the regime's attempt to destroy that civilian hospital from the air using uh, air power. Just one uh, early warning of what was going to happen in terms of the regime's uh, declaration of war on its own people effectively in order to, to keep power. And we go from there, we look at the early manifestations of Kurdish power in uh, Derik, uh, that town on the border there close to Iraq, and uh, the very interesting attempts by the PKK, which is what it was, to uh, to uh, get organized there. A fascinating anecdote to remember is just, just how many of the Kurdish activists who were on the ground then creating those structures in northeast Syria were themselves non-Arabic speakers. In other words, you know, well, these were people who'd come down from Kandil, you know, from the PKK uh, heartland up there and, and in order to do a job for the movement of creating you know a women's center or a youth center or a, or a military structure or an intelligence structure or a police organization it was a it was a full court press by the pkk in uh, in northeast syria in 2013 and this is something again i, I say that not in order to criticize or, or recommend any policy but simply to uh, to point that out because it's worth remembering and then we look at the isis war and i was able to interview a number of isis members in uh, in Kilis on the border in uh, 2014, just before that ISIS, that very dramatic ISIS push eastwards into Iraq, which of course took place in the summer of that year when ISIS went from, what, what did they call him in this town at one time, and a junior varsity team to something much more uh, consequential. Um, I interviewed ISIS people not in captivity, and I think this is an important point. A lot of the interviews we have with ISIS members are interviews carried out with fighters in captivity, which in my opinion, purely from a professional point of view, is a, a very, very dubious uh, mode of, of work. People in captivity will tell you what they uh, know their jailers want you to hear, and you want you to be careful of that. These were ISIS people in Kilis, living incognito, uh, but safely and in freedom. And it was fascinating to speak to them. What did I take away from those interviews? And this is visible in the book as well. These were local Syrian men from the Azaz area who had started their, their insurgent careers as members of the Northern Storm uh, Brigade that people here will, will be familiar with and who had gone over to ISIS because of its greater, in their view, greater effectiveness and, and absence of corruption. And this is something which is worth bearing in mind. This is a part of the ISIS story, which I think isn't sufficiently stressed when we, when we tell, as we should tell, you know, the horror stories of Sinjar Mountain and so on and so forth. We should also remember... You know, ISIS didn't emerge from the sky and it didn't emerge from a foreign country. Most of the people who were engaged with, with ISIS or were, were local men who had got involved because of local dynamics, uh, not all of which are otherworldly or apocalyptic, some of which are comprehensible. I say this not in any way, of course, to excuse the atrocities, but simply because it's vital that we understand that if we're to have a clear picture of what this was. Um, I covered Sinjar Mountain in that area in the summer of 2014, and I was just 10 kilometers from there in a close to a place called Jaza. Uh, when the Yazidis were up there, and I witnessed the uh, uh, opening of the corridor to the mountain by the uh, the YPG. And since I've uh, probably uh, lost some Kurdish friends already from what I was just saying about Northeast Syria in 2013, I should uh, redress the balance by saying I think that this was the opening of that corridor was uh, a magnificent moral achievement and uh, was uh, an example of the human spirit at its best and most generous. And it was a, uh, a magnificent uh, and uh, memorable thing to, to witness. Uh, lastly, with regard to the, uh, the book, we, we then go on to witness that the wars, the two wars turns, the twilight of the rebellion, 
the uh, fragmentation of the rebellion into uh, small groups which ended up and have ended up of course uh, effectively as military contractors for a variety of foreign states for the Turks for Israel perhaps to a small degree for the Americans in Tanef for the Jordanians also and we I spent some time in Gaziantep in 2016 talking to rebel groups and, and witnessing that process where they realized they weren't going to win, they realized they probably weren't going home, and they were looking for other uh, options. We spent time in Mosul witnessing the destruction of uh, Islamic State in that city and then also in northern Syria uh, in uh, 2016 as ISIS was being pushed southwards by the then SDF forces, of course, down Al Haul and Shadadi and that whole remote areas where they were losing ground. And, and finally, I managed uh, last year to, to get... Uh, sorry, I, I missed something out. I, I was also one of the people who focused quite early on on the importance of the Shia militias in Iraq, and I spent some time with them in uh, Anbar province in, uh, observing their frontline activities, Qatayb Hezbollah and uh, the Badr organization. And once again, I think we have not yet, as observers of this, this picture, begun to understand just how important that Shia militia mobilization of summer 2014 was, of course, after the Jihad Fatwa of Ayatollah uh, Ali al-Sistani. But you know, the, the emergence of that force, the rendering permanent of that force, and the political implications of that, I think, are only just now starting to become really apparent, and I hope people here in Washington are, are, are realizing you know, just how serious that is. We have elections, or well, there are elections in, in May in Iraq, and the Al-Fatah list, the list of the, the PMUs, is, is, the, is probably going to be the big story of those elections, and it ought to be having deep implications, I think, for policy considerations here. This is a very, very major achievement of the Iranians, uh, effectively creating you know, a version of, a, a much bigger uh, version of, of Hezbollah in an early stage there in Iraq, and that's going to mean a great deal for Iraq's future going down the line. I mentioned we, we were in Mosul for the defeat of ISIS, and that's self-explanatory, and I don't need to go into that detail with that. And finally, I managed to, uh, to spend some time in the regime-controlled part of the country last April. Uh, I managed to join a, a delegation of uh, pro-regime uh, journalists and activists. I'm of course, not a pro-regime journalist and activist, but it was uh, <laughs> nevertheless uh, an interesting thing to do. Yeah, so this was uh, was fun, and we went to Damascus, uh, to Aleppo, to Homs, to Palmyra, to Krak de Chevalier, and uh, it was fascinating to observe the regime in its I in the strange story that it tells to its foreign supporters, which everybody here, of course, knows. But nevertheless, to actually hear the, the you know this this story of of foreign, of course, Israeli-centered conspiracy. Uh, against the uh, against the regime with the intention of uh, of bringing it down because of its its status as the last castle of uh, of resistance and Arab dignity, it was an interesting thing to to experience that up close. It was also interesting to note the weakness of the regime in Damascus in two ways. Firstly, uh, fascinating to note that all the checkpoints within old city of Damascus are NDF, not Syrian army, i.e., this uh, auxiliary force created by the Iranians in 2013. That's who's looking after daily, I mean, you know, physical daily security and. In the, in the old city of Damascus, fascinating to note. And secondly, as I wrote about in foreign policy after, after the visit, secondly, the impunity with which Russian person, personnel uh, behave uh, in Damascus, the extent to which they are untouchable by the forces of law and order in Damascus. I witnessed an incident in which one of our, our delegation had a gun put to his head by a Russian, a drunken Russian journalist in the old city of Damascus. And when my friends tried to call the police, the police asked, Is, was the person who did this a Russian? And the answer was yes, and they said, well, in that case, there's nothing we can do. This, I thought, was an interesting indication of the, the balance of power, so to speak, uh, and then how one can learn a little bit from, from anecdotes also. Just finally, then, with regard to uh, some lessons which we learn about media coverage from the experience of uh, the Syrian uh, war. Um, none of them, I think, are particularly heartwarming. They're not necessarily all that positive, but they're important. Firstly, I think what we learn, which perhaps we didn't quite know before, is that new media and social media is, is a double-edged sword. The notion that the emergence of new media and social media is obviously helpful to dissidents and rebels and revolutionaries and sort of shift the balance of power between them and repressive regimes, I think is something which needs, that's a, a claim which needs to be examined in regard to the Syrian war. Because what we've noticed, that what we observe in the Syrian war is the way in which the regime itself and its supporters have very effectively harnessed and used the power of social media. You know, Contrary to what one would have expected if, if one was, as we, many of us probably were, a regular reader of Sana'a, 
you know, online prior to the war, it turns out the regime knows, knew and learned, or its supporters at least, knew how to put out messages which were fast, which were accessible, which were exciting, and which in a certain way were, were convincing, at least to a certain public, uh, in, both in the Arab world and the West. And that's something to know. And of course, if we think of the regime in that way, we should also note ISIS use of social media, very, very effective use of social media. That's to say, not only can regimes apparently harness these forces for their purposes, but also very, very dreadful and negative uh, movements uh, can do so as well. This is firstly. Secondly, I think what we note from the Syrian war is that contrary to the, you know, to the, the sense given by some proponents of the revolution in media taking place, regimes can still close areas to coverage. You know, the possibility of silence, the possibility of imposing silence on an area in order to then do what a regime wishes to do is still there. Very large swathes of the Syrian war for very long periods of the war were outside of media coverage, right? If we think of southwestern Syria, for example, for the entirety of the war has been beyond the reach uh, of foreign media because the Israeli Syrian border and the uh, Jordanian Syrian border were always closed. They didn't become penetratable, and so journalists didn't manage to get in. So that's been quiet all the way throughout. What's currently taking place in eastern Ghouta, to a great extent, although not completely, also in Afrin, and certainly in Idlib and Aleppo, is outside of media coverage. So the notion that sort of nowadays, unlike back in the days of Hammer and, and the, uh, the, re the revolt of the late 70s and early 80s, nowadays everything is visible, nothing is invisible, media is everywhere. No, no, not necessarily. What the Syria war shows us is that's not necessarily true. And lastly, perhaps more encouragingly, since I don't want to uh, leave everybody in a bad mood after, uh, after, after lunch, um, uh, is the following. Uh, again, this, even this is a mixed message, but nevertheless encouraging. I think if we look at the Syria war, what it shows us also is the importance of traditional, properly financed media organizations. That's to say the Syria war was characterized famously by the kind of uh, the, the descent on Syria of all manner of, of, of independent freelancers seeking to do media work. But if we think of the major stories that emerged from Syria, uh, most of them were produced, were, were revealed by traditional media organizations who were only able to reveal them because they were traditional media organizations. That's said, they were properly financed, they had enough time to spend in the field, and probably they had local uh, language and local uh, local knowledge. I mean, think of some examples of this. Uh, think of the revelation, of course, of the use of sarin gas in eastern Ghouta, which, I've, which I, if I remember correctly, was revealed by Le Monde. And it was revealed by the French Le Monde newspaper because two very brave journalists from Le Monde were able to spend about three weeks in the field, very close to Damascus, and to get that story out. A freelancer could never have done that. We think of Christoph Reuter's work, for example, for Der Spiegel, uh, revealing the issue of internal ISIS arrangements and of the, uh, the intelligence security structures created by ISIS. Christoph and his colleagues were only able to do that because as an employee of Der Spiegel, he can spend a great deal of time inside Syria. Christoph himself, of course, is fluent in Arabic and knows that, and, and lives, I think, in Beirut and knows the area well. And this is all a product, not only of that person's individual uh, talent or courage, but also of a traditional media structure that has the money and wherewithal to keep people like that in the field and enable them to do their work. So I think an interesting last sort of media outcome of the Syrian war uh, is the fact is the importance of traditional media organizations. And conversely, the fact that when they're not there, and insofar as they're not there, then, you know, the, the, the sort of blackout effect of that is very significant and worth uh, thinking about. So on that note, I've already gone on a little bit more than I wanted to, so uh, I'll, I'll be quiet, and I hope uh, I look forward to our questions and uh, conversation. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you so much, John. That was very thoughtful. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of uh, moderators' comments and give you a couple of uh, introductory uh, non-softball questions uh, for the sake of those of you that have stayed on after lunch. Um, and then we can go into the question and answer. So first of all, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, I reviewed this book. Um, I think what you really succeeded in doing, um, and I think you, you showed that here in your presentation here today, was that you made an unusual contribution to the understanding, not just of this war, but I think covering the Middle East, and that you made a, a readable book that was policy relevant. So one of the good things coming out of this horrible war, it's hard to put it in such way, is that we have a lot more Syrian voices that have come out of the conflict, and many of them have sat down and put pen to paper with a lot of um, Westerners uh, trying to help translate those works and try to get those ideas out there, uh, particularly um, in the role of activists and some also um, those that went into, um, uh, went into journalism. But 
as as authentic as those books are, and as glad as uh, glad as I am to to have them on my shelf and and to and to read them and to gain insights from them, um, there's a lot of times when I read these books, I'm not really sure where they would plug in or connect to the Legos of policy as we know it here in Washington. And I think that was one of the great successes of your book was um, trying to come up with some of these lessons or to be able to digest some of these lessons. Um, because it's one thing that I learned when I came to Washington, and here I'm talking about a, an, an earlier stage. I, I reported from from Syria and Lebanon between 2001 and 2008, is that a lot of policy um, goals are, are driven by cliches and tropes that come out of original reporting. Um, and there you will hear them in policy circles along the way. And some of you that have served in government, um, I think, uh, you know, sort of can, can understand this. Um, um, and they must be invented somewhere. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the most famous ones at my time there was uh, bringing Bashar back to the Arab fold. Uh, that was one of the one of my most uh, one of my favorite ones. Also, that Bashar was held back by the old guard. Um, you know, even though years had passed, the Ba'ath Party conference of 2005 had passed, and actually most of those who were, were relevant to the regime had um, or to the old guard um, um, had left. Um, but what I what I think that I what what I really liked um, was how your book and so the, um, when I was in Syria, the number of people who would speak their mind openly uh, or even in any kind of way was 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 much more limited than during the uprising. That was also another good thing of the uprising. Um, what I really liked about your book was that um, was that it, it helped me remember the the in the very confusing environment that. Um, not only has become the, the Syrian war, but predated the Syrian war. The the only thing that I knew, the the best way that I knew to 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 weigh out um, everything that I was hearing was to listen to my gut. And I think, um, in, in in you know, while while that's a cliche, I think you very successfully in there. You're you're clearly going through this investigation, trying to figure out where this where this uprising is going. Um, and I think that you 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 use your gut um, in a, in a very good way. Um, but and, and I think this gets to your to your point, which I thought was really profound, was that the traditional mainline media organizations, which gen still continue to generate some some really great stories um, with, with the assistance granted of other activists and so on on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was very important because um, the Syria has always been and I'm not sure why it's so um, it, it's a sort of um, backdrop against which. Uh, people can just project the most nonsensical ideas that you've ever heard in your life. Um, and I'm not just talking about the Assad regime. And I think it was really, it came down to the conversations that I would have with my editors abroad. Um, and also uh, those, you know, in, in, in think tanks here in Washington, including, including at this one, that would help me understand a little bit about what was actually within the realm of the possible and not. Um, and, um, and I think, um, I think that that definitely gets to your point about you know why perhaps those media organizations succeeded, um, but I will say that uh, I I think combing through all of the social media stuff is is still remains quite difficult um, uh, for me, and um, um, so I think that's so that's sort of an initial point. Um, now, I, I, my first question to you is: um, you had mentioned I think an important issue, and that was how you had you had seen these folks from Kandil come down uh, into the to the uh, Kurdish areas of Syria or mixed uh, areas of Syria. Um, we've seen other foreign involvement uh, in Syria, non non Arabic speaking, so to say, uh, the ir Iranian uh, forces coming into Syria in various forms. Um, you know, what can we learn from I know this is what can we learn from the PKK and the IRGC in terms of if and I, and I, I the, if you want to be successful in an environment like like a, de a decaying state, a decaying, mm -hmm. um, a, a rapidly deteriorating situation, what were the keys to success there? What what made the PKK and the IRGC much more successful than, for example, Turkey and some of the other parties, um, pre perhaps even including the United States in in the Syrian war? Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating question. So uh, I think that there is f a very clear uh, initial uh, answer to that, and it is the following: in the IRGC context and in the PKK uh, context, they were a single force without competitor, without competition. You know, they were a single structure that went in to do whatever it is they were doing. In the PKK, 
case organizing you know Kurdish areas from which the regime had departed and in the IRGC case first and foremost uh, filling the gap of available man available infantry manpower for the Assad regime which is what the IRGC was that was the first and most urgent task for the Iranians when they went into Syria in force uh, in 2013. In both cases, neither side had any competition. The Kurds, uh, there are of course other Kurdish parties, is that the KNC and the pro Barzani uh, parties, but these were not uh, in force on the ground and had no armed uh, young men uh, in the, on the Syrian side of the border. So the PKK came down and had effectively no, no competition. It was virgin territory, it got organized. And IRGC in the same the same way, they came into regime-controlled areas and they, there was nobody else trying to do the work they were going to do, and the Assad regime desperately needed the help which they were able to offer. So they were able to sort of operate, you know, in, without, uh, without uh, being troubled by, by, by competition. By contrast, if we look at the Sunni Arab rebel world, well, we, you know, we don't even need to go further. You know, what there was from the very beginning was a, was a bewildering, you know, crisscrossing network of different competitive rebel militias, and different competing would-be uh, supporters, you know, whether it's Qatar or Saudi Arabia or the Muslim Brotherhood or Turkey, there was a, an, it was a, it was an absolute mess from the start, and it never managed to sort itself out. It, it came closest to sorting itself out in the summer of 2015, of course, when the when the Jaish al-Fatah thing uh, came along, and there was a moment where the rebels looked like getting their act together, which was what triggered, of course, the Russian. Uh, response that put a stop to that. But the rebellion never came close. So I think one of the issues was there were just too many, the Americans or, or the Turks or, or the Jordanians were, were, you know, were from the start part of just a confusing mass of rebel organizations that never managed to, to, to get it together. I think that's one, that's one thing. I'm not sure if we can learn much from it because, you know, the situation objectively just was what it was. But if we're trying to understand why IRGC or PKK were so successful, one thing is they simply didn't have any competition. The second thing is that both IRGC and PKK, each in their very uh, different ways, you know, have a very well-developed methodology and praxis of irregular warfare. That's what these organizations, each in their very different way, do. They've been in the business a long time. They're good at what they do, and they know exactly how they want to, to create such a, a program. So when they came in, they had that sort of existing model of how to do this stuff, and they simply began to, to apply it, you know? And I think that's something which is very important to note as well. You know, by, by, com by very stark comparison, I think, with many of the Sunni states of the region, including Turkey, but certainly the Gulf states, you know, th they don't really have that body of knowledge. They don't have people who are irregular warfare people who just know how to do this stuff. And the IRGC and PKK, each in their separate ways, are excellent schools, so to speak, for irregular warfare. And they went in and they, they, they created their models, and, and it's lasted and it's, uh, and it's worked. So that, that would be the second aspect, I think, which we can, in this respect, which we can learn from. In other words, irregular warfare, proxy warfare, the combination of political and military activity, you know, these are areas which are vital for success in the fragmented and confused spaces where the state has collapsed in the Middle East. And IRGC and PKK are you know, top class uh, uh, players in that environment and there's no reason why the West could not be and cannot be good at it too. It's, it's, it's not something inherent to Iranian Shia or to Kurds, they're just good at this. It's because they've worked out a way of doing it. We can do that too. We need to get into that business, I think. Um, very interesting. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think from the you know, one of the things that I noticed in terms of going to border areas and trying to look at the opposition, whether it was the political or military, was that one of, one of the challenges was that, um, you know, politics is very much an, uh, an open exercise um, and it's, it's a d designed to corral people. Whereas I think the United States, at least according to um, reports, uh, uh, pursued their support covertly. And so therefore, uh, matching the, the, those activities with a political agenda uh, oftentimes did not meet, um, wh wh whereas m pr perhaps more successful at eastern Syria, um, where there was a much different kind of uh, overt program and continues to be. Um, the, the second question I have is, you had mentioned about schools of thought in Israel, uh, one about the regime coming back, and then the other school of thought, which I think is the one you belong to, and that is that it's, that it's actually not the regime that's coming back, it's sort of a new hybrid thing mm -hmm. or um, uh, challenge, so to speak. So my question to you is, um, and I, I don't know if you can answer this briefly, and it's one of the burdens of coming from abroad and so on, but can you explain to us a little bit about what is the current debate about how to respond 
to those to to whatever's coming in Syria. I mean, we we hear a lot of things about we we hear various things. We hear something about um, uh, Israel accepting. Uh, Bashar's presence as long as Iranian militia stay a certain distance back from the Golan. We hear some people, for some people, this is unacceptable. We hear uh, uh, also that uh, there's thought of supporting rebels in southwestern Syria. Can you give us a little bit of the, about what, what is, what's, what's the current thinking bouncing around security circles um, in, 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 in just a few words? Sure, yeah. Let me just, uh, just something else occurred to me with regard to the first question, which I wanted to say before moving on to the second one, which was that, you know, this uh, aspect of, of experienced organizations moving in was visible when I spent time with, with the Kurdish fighters in 2013 compared to I spent time with the rebels in, uh, in Idlib and Aleppo. And just tactically, the way that YPG young people you know, were able to behave in a, in a combat context was entirely different to that of the Syrian rebels because they were properly, they went through a, a, a rapid but, but comprehensive process of training prior to being deployed. The way they were able to move as small units was quite different to the very, very chaotic, to put it mildly, you know, way that many of the rebel groups behaved. And that was because they had, they had real teachers and a real school, you know, and the, the Arab rebels did not. And this is something also worth remembering. Um, with regard to Israel, Look, you know, the uh, the fact of the Iranian advance uh, in southwest Syria is not uh, under dispute in Israel. That's very clear and it's being very closely observed. The uh, the emergent, adva- the, the advance of the regime and the uh, probable return of the regime, maybe even to Kunetra province uh, in the uh, months or, or years ahead at least, you know, is something which I think is, is taken as, uh, not taken as red, but taken as, as extremely probable. I think that the dispute, or not the dispute, the differing opinions are with regard to how Israel uh, effectively responds to that. Um, And I think that there are, uh, in this regard, hawks and doves, so to speak. That's to say there are are voices who are of the opinion that it is absolutely necessary to lay down a clear red line with regard to Iranian advancement westwards, and you can, and then you can argue about how many kilometers. I remember there was an initial demand, if I'm not mistaken, for 60 kilometers, which is kind of odd because that takes you into the suburbs of Damascus, so that was never likely. But now there's, you know, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers that the Iranians must be kept eastwards of. There are people in, there are voices within Israel who are of the opinion that that is, uh, that needs to be a real red line, and that if the price of that is uh, collision. Uh, between Israel and Iran, a frontal collision between Israel and Iran, that's a price that uh, that needs to be to be paid. I think that there are other voices, perhaps uh, less publicly heard, uh, who are of the opinion that the emergent conflict system in southwest Syria is one to which Israel can apply similar methods to the ones that it applies in southern Lebanon or, for that matter, in West Bank or Gaza. The famous uh, phrase, mowing the lawn, which uh, everybody here is probably familiar with, uh, being the, uh, the point to note. That is to say that even if the Iranians do continue to build in advance, Israel can minimize the danger of that by taking action when it thinks it needs to take action, making the Iranians know that they are not free agents and effectively deterring the Iranians and their friends, even as they do manage to establish themselves perhaps close to the border. There are those who have the opinion, I think there's something to it, by the way, that Israel has, through similar methods, managed so far to prevent the Iranians coming close to the border. After all, the Iranian attempt to reach the border and establish uh, an infrastructure on the border is not something new. It's going, it goes all the way back to 2015. If we think of the, the early demise of such figures as Jihad, Jihad Mugnir or uh, the late uh, Samir Kuntar, you know, these men were killed uh, in the process of attempting to build such an infrastructure. And so far, Israel has, without uh, entering into a direct collision with Iran, managed to uh, prevent that infrastructure from emerging. So I think there's a, there's a dispute as to the correct approach to take with regard to the Iranian advance, and that's something which... Uh, in which people break down to its hawks and doves. Earlier on in the war, obviously, there was a, a, a dispute in analysis between, you know, whether the regime was going to survive or whether it was not going to survive. This, of course, is all now uh, part of the past. Everybody understands that the regime uh, is going to survive. And I think there's a, there's a recalibration going on because for a quite a long period after it became clear that the regime was going to survive, there was a sense that, yes, but the rebellion's going to survive too. 
And so we're going to be able to sort of sit on our side of the border and continue to watch different factions in Syria uh, slaughter one another. And now there's a, there's a recalibration of that. There's a sense, of, well, that's not actually going to go on forever. The regime side, and you're right in characterizing me as somebody who believes it's the regime side, not the regime itself, as I said, Assad, but mainly it's the Russians and the Iranians, is on the way towards some kind of decision. And we have to, uh, to begin to work out how we're going to respond to that. And that's what's dominating the discussion right now. Great. Um, thank you very much, John. So why don't we open it up for questions? Uh, Leah, you have the mic, right? Um, why don't we start out with uh, David Pollack? Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, fascinating. Um, I, I want to, um, to nobody's surprise, focus on Turkey and the Kurds. And it seems to me that there actually was a very important shift in that picture in two different periods that you're covering. From 2012 to 2015, this is how I see it, the, whatever the connection between the PYD and the PKK, they kept their promise not to attack Turkey or to support the PKK inside Turkey from Syrian territory, which they made in 2012. And the Turkish government, for its part, was content not only to coordinate for example, with Kurdish uh, uh, militias and with us in the liberation of Kobani, but also to host Saleh Muslim, yeah. the leader of the PYD, in Ankara for official talks uh, while they were engaging in some form of talks with even Abdullah Öcalan and so on. And all of that changed quite suddenly from, I think, from the Turkish side in 2015 which is when the Turks broke off all those talks, uh, broke the ceasefire with the PKK inside Turkey, a year later invaded Syrian territory in order to split the Kurdish cantons in the north of that country, and of course now we're engaged in a war in Afrin and in chasing Salah Muslim all over Europe as a terrorist. So what happened? What accounts for that change? That is something that maybe the answer to that is more in Ankara than in the places that you were working in, but I'd be very interested in your take on that. Mm -hmm. so we'll, I'll answer, we'll yep. do, yeah. Okay, thanks David. Yeah, my view is that uh, the explanation for this lies within uh, Turkish politics itself, and specifically within the elections of, of 2015, and specifically within the very, in the very major advances made by uh, HDP uh, in those elections. That is to say, uh, Erdogan and, and those around him after the elections in 2015 were required to uh, to note the HDP as a, a potential real internal political challenge. And the reason why uh, Demotash and his friends were able to, to begin to constitute that challenge was because they were beginning to attract the attention and support of many secular and liberal Turks who, who were, were seeing in them you know, a, a potential real uh, uh, challenger or opposition to AKP and the AKP and Erdogan project uh, in the country. As a result, I think, uh, you know, from an AKP point of view, that challenge had to be destroyed. And ruthlessly, but quite sensibly and logically from uh, Erdogan's point of view, the way to do that was to revive the war between the government, the Turkish state and the PKK, because that's the way that then forms a backdrop to the repression and destruction of the HDP as a political force. And of course, from a, from a sort of sentiment or electoral point of view, what it does is it drives, it terrifies and drives away all those secular and moderate Turks who might have begun to see in the HDP, you know, a center of support. All of a sudden, it's Turks against Kurds again, it's HDP's connections to PKK again, and it becomes a totally different animal to what it looked like in 2015. So I, I absolutely think that's the, that's the basis to this. The Turkish state took a decision to end the peace process and revive the conflict with PKK because they understood that a Kurdish-related political force was emerging within Turkey as a real potential challenger to the AKP's ongoing project of, uh, of the transformation of Turkey in the directions with which we're familiar. That's, that's how I understand that. Okay. Um, Patrick? Uh, a number of foreign governments have spent a large amount of money trying to provide humanitarian aid in Syria, mostly through international agencies and through a variety of NGOs, some of which work with the Syrian government, some of which do not. Do you have any comments on the efficacy of the uh, of these various uh, efforts? Mm 
Yes, with regard to, to humanitarian aid, the, the, the determination of international bodies to uh, continue to work uh, only through the, the Syrian government or in cooperation with the Syrian government has had a, a, a very, very considerable uh, negative effect on the efficacy of their relief efforts. Because the problem is, of course, that if you cooperate with the Syrian regime, uh, you can only work in regime-controlled areas. And by, by, the nature of, by the very nature of the conflict, and also as a result of the regime's efforts, the places which really needed humanitarian aid were the areas where the regime was not present and did not control. And as a result of that, you know, the, the really terrible humanitarian situations that emerged, uh, for example, let's say in rebel-controlled uh, eastern Aleppo prior, to, uh, prior to, the, to it falling to the regime in late 2016, were just not addressed. You know, international aid bodies weren't there. They were there in places they weren't needed, and they were not in places where they were needed. Now, I witnessed also uh, an additional negative uh, fallout from that, which is that quite well, let's say organizations with which we may not entirely be in sympathy were ones that stepped into the vacuum and provided aid often where it was most desperately needed. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was coming out of Aleppo city and, and then Aleppo province across the Turkish border in August of uh, 2012, and we were crossing over Baba Salami uh, crossing point, refugees had begun to gather close to the border fence because they thought uh, often correctly, that the Syrian regime would be too frightened to bomb from the air too close to the border because they'd be frightened of, of, of a bomb landing in Turkey with, uh, un, with unpleasant uh, consequences for them. So you had a throng of, of human beings, of, of, of civilians living close to the border in agricultural land with absolutely no infrastructure of any kind, no housing, no, no sanitation, etc., etc. It was summer, so it, wasn't, it didn't, hadn't reached desperate stage at that point. The interesting thing to note is that Baba Salame, there was one relief organization only present, and that relief organization was the Turkish IHH, right? was the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood Associated Relief Organization, IHH, the people who we in Israel remember because of the Mavi Mamra and so on in 2009. So the, the decisions taken by uh, humanitarian organizations to, to some degree kind of ignore the rebel-controlled areas not only were bad for the individuals in those areas, and they were, but also it enabled organizations that we probably wouldn't want to help advance their agenda to advance their agenda. You know, this, at the end of the day, if IHH are the only people who are going to provide you with a tent or, or food or so, you'll probably have some gratitude towards IHH, and understandably and justifiably so. We, don't, we shouldn't be wanting people to be having gratitude to the IHH, and that was something of, uh, of the consequence of that. One could also argue that with regard to the Kurdish areas too, you know, the, the PKK, I mean, PKK I, I don't want to compare them to IHH, I have a different opinion of each of those organizations, but, you know, the fact that the void there also allowed those groups to, to come in and play that vital role and build political support and legitimacy as a result of that. So I think it's been, uh, it's been deeply problematic throughout. And, you know, and I have friends also from UN and from... Uh, humanitarian organizations who, who, who go to Damascus regularly and are, and are resident there. And I think that they, you know, they're friends, but I would be critical of, of the role which they've played uh, in, the, in the course of the last six years. They haven't done anywhere close to satisfying their, their mandate and their duty in the Syrian context, I think. Um, Ambassador? Mark Ginsburg, uh, Jonathan, your courage in all of this, I think, it needs to be commended uh, just by listening to what you had to say and how you managed to maneuver yourself around. You seem to be unscathed. I hope you are physically and mentally. <laughs> mentally, Two. I couldn't possibly comment, <laughs> but physically, I think, yeah. yes. Two questions. Uh, what are the Russian equities in all of this? You talk, and, and I understand deeply about what may happen between Iran and Israel, and between, as you mentioned, Russia and the United States, east of the Euphrates. But uh, does Putin have any ability to influence what may happen in the post-Civil War period that would prevent conflicts inside Syria that could somehow undermine Russian ability to control its key interests and how will Russia use that influence? And number two, if I may, as a corollary, all of the refugees, whether they be in Jordan or Lebanon or elsewhere in the diaspora from Syria, uh, do you expect that as a result of the, this transformation that they may indeed want to return or w would return and what impact they may have on the equations that you laid out in so far as the post-Civil War period? Thanks. Um, with regard to, to Russia and, and the, the extent, or what the Russians want, and also the extent to which they can 
uh, impact. I think if we if we look at Sochi, you know what's what the Sochi conference, you know, at the end of January shows us is is actually the the limitations of of Russian ability. You know, the Russians uh, very successfully, I think, you know, promoted a kind of image of themselves. As, as all capable, you know, when the Russians step in, they always get it right, they always get what they want, they always win, you know. Uh, well, the incident in Conoco gas field also kind of uh, hits that image, but also on a diplomatic level, I think Sochi, you know, damages it. I mean, Sochi was the moment where the Russians were supposed to bring everybody together and, and you know, unlike the useless, endless Geneva process, this was going to be the place where things began to happen. And actually what it demonstrated was just how how difficult it was, you know, for Russia, first of all, to get everybody in the room. If you remember, the opposition delegation went home because they were upset about the absence of their flag on the on the posters for the conference. But also, you know, the Kurds were not there. Also, the uh, the regime was not happy with the outcome of uh, of the conference. Also, Lavrov himself was heckled in the not a, not an, a, 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 an experience to which he is accustomed. You know, while giving his speech, you know, so it was uh, it was uh, an absolute failure, Sochi, and it showed just the way in which the Russians are, are limited in their abilities. Why were they limited? I think the, the reason is clear because, you know, you can't get anything on the cheap and you can't get diplomatic achievements on the cheap either. And if what you wanted, to, the very Russian success in Syria uh, is because of the very light footprint and limited agenda of the Russians. That's why they've been able to, to do it without getting sucked into a quagmire and without uh, having kids coming home in, in zinc coffins like, like in Afghanistan and so on. But that has an effect as well. If you want to do it on the cheap, it means you're not going to have the amount of leverage with the various players that you might otherwise have if you were, you know, if you were their major paymaster and if you were their, their major uh, uh, supporter and sponsor. So I think the Russians are limited as a result of their own uh, the, the agenda that they have chosen in Syria, it gives them, it, it limits their ability to to have that impact. Having said that, they of course do have very considerable impact in a number of areas. Firstly, the regime owes its life to the Russians. It owes its life to the Iranians too, but it also owes its life to the Russians. Obviously, the air intervention uh, in September 30th, 2015 and onwards was what has primarily turned the tide of the war. The rebels were winning the war uh, at that point. And that means that, you know, the Russians, the regime understands that and the Russians will be able certainly to insist within regime controlled areas on whatever agenda it is they want. What, what does it appear they want? Well, they want Bashar to be there, you know, first of all, at least till 2021, but probably also beyond that. They want to have their basing rights. They want to have Khamenei. They want to develop uh, uh, Tartus and Latakia, apparently, to receive submarines in the years ahead. So they want to build a much more powerful sort of military basis within the country. I presume they want to continue selling weapons to the people they sell weapons to. They've made their point with regard to themselves as a capable as, a, as a, uh, a reliable ally. They've made their point with regard to the efficacy of Russian weapons systems and military abilities in the Syrian context. That's something they wanted to do and they've done that. And my sense is that the Russians are quite happy actually with, uh, with the current situation. Everyone says, well, you know, they, they desperately need somebody else to pick up the bill for reconstruction. That's true, but I imagine that President Putin is not le losing sleep uh, the notion of of people still being homeless in in homes or whatever, yeah, you know, it will happen when it happens, and I don't suppose he's that upset if it hasn't happened yet or doesn't happen within the next year. So yes, reconstruction is important, but the Russians can can wait for as long as they they need to wait, and they're, and they're going to continue to do so. Um, I think from an Israeli point of view, there's a particular important issue here because, of course, there, with regard to to Andrew's question earlier on, there's a big discussion in Israel regarding the extent of potential Russian leverage over the Iranians. Uh, my view, at least, in, in regard to that debate is that the Russians uh, neither want to nor indeed could you know, influence Iranian uh, practices in southwest Syria. The way in which they've divided it up is that the Iranians have their project and the Russians have their project. They try not to bother each other, and much of the time they agree anyway. And certainly the Russians have no mechanism, no lever whereby they could tell the Iranians stop doing A, B, or C. Again, this goes back to the lightness of the Russian footprint. In Syria, they don't have forces on the ground that could tell the Iranians what to do because they didn't want to have that extent of a presence on the ground. That limits their their abilities. So I would say that Russia has largely achieved what it wanted to achieve uh, in Syria, and uh, what they would like, I think, very much is pretty much for the status quo to continue. Which is why you know the most recent events, for example, the issue of what took place in uh, in southern Deir Ezzor in uh, early February, are, are not good for them. That's not good. Planes crashing and killing everybody is not good either. You know that that makes them start to look a little bit less uh, competent than they've been looking up until now. I think they just they would really like the current situation to just kind of carry on. I think they'd be very happy with that. With regard to refugees returning, well, of course, some refugees have returned, but in small numbers. 
Uh, my own sense is, is the following. First of all, as we know, almost all the refugees are Sunni Arabs. In other words, almost all the refugees come from that population that has largely been in insurgency or that was the, the backbone to the insurgency. So I think that will limit you know, the desire or ability of those people uh, to return. Um, secondly, if we go back to what we were saying about the Russians, if reconstruction isn't happening, you know, and if the country is going to, at least for a long period of time, remain a pile of rubble, and if conflict is going to continue, then these, of course, will themselves impact on the desire or ability of, of refugees to return. I mean, we were talking about three active zones of conflict, you know, Eastern Ghouta, Afrin, and Idlib Aleppo countryside. Those are all, you know, major areas of conflagration. They're not going anywhere. People are still dying as a result of combat, you know, in very large numbers in Syria. The war's not over. And as we were discussing earlier, even when the wars begin to be over, other wars are being born to take their place. That, I think, is what we're, we're looking at in Syria. It's not going to be a return to anything resembling tranquility for quite a long time to come. And as a result of those two aspects, one, they're mainly Sunni Arab Muslims, and Sunni Arab Muslims haven't won the war that they were involved in. Yeah? And secondly, in any case, wars are not wrapping up in Syria. And insofar as they are, new wars are coming. And these, I think, will, will serve to prevent the return of, of very large numbers of refugees for the uh, foreseeable future. Uh, the gentleman here in the green jacket. Hi, uh, Maury Amate. Uh, I'm interested if you could comment a little more about the relationship between the PKK and the YPG. I mean, who is calling the shots there? Is there a mastermind? I mean, you, you don't hear of any names coming who, who are really supposed to be uh, leadership. And I'm just curious about how you manage. Do, do you have language skills or do you... Uh, have to uh, count on interpreters. Mm, okay, thanks for that. Um, with regard to uh, the uh, Kandil or the Kurdish question, um, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question and I'm happy to, to respond in, in a little bit of detail. Um, the answer is that there is uh, a uh, parallel, uh, real leadership structure present in Syria uh, behind the names with which we are all familiar. In other words, uh, which doesn't mean that those people are puppets, but it means that there are there are Kandil people, people who came down from Kandil, who are certainly involved in and perhaps dominant within the decision-making process in those uh, areas. I've met some of those people. Uh, we could name some of the names, but we, we probably don't need to. Um, the, these are people, for the most part, who are themselves Syrians. In other words, the PKK is not stupid and they're not going to send in one as I've mentioned before you could come across activists who didn't know Arabic on, on the street level back in 2013 but the people who are exercising effective leadership and political power in uh, eastern Syria from as a result of Kandil of coming down from Kandil mountain are Arabic speakers and for the most part are Syrians themselves Syrians who you know 10 or 15 years ago or whatever joined the PKK and became PKK cadres and have now been sent by the movement back to uh, take up leadership roles inside uh, Rojava or inside uh, Democratic Federation of Northern Syria, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's the thing. There is a parallel uh, structure. Um, that's, I guess, the bad news if you if you don't if you don't like the PKK. The good news is that the PKK are not idiots. So it's not that as a result of that, Rojava is going to be or northeastern Syria is going to be used in the PKK's war against Turkey. Right. It, the fact that Kandil has maybe the key leadership role in the area doesn't mean that it's going to be used as hinterland for the insurgency against Turkey. Why not? Why not? This is related to, to an understanding of what the PKK is. The PKK sees itself as a pan-Kurdish political movement. That's to say it, it, Syria or Iran or Iraq, Kurdish areas, are no less important to it than, are, than is Turkish Kurdistan. It's not that it's a Turkish Kurdish insurgent movement above all else and it wants to use everything else to help that insurgency. It is that it has an, it has an overriding political agenda which takes, in, which takes in all these areas and therefore the Syrian project is one thing, the Turkish project is another thing and they understand the importance of ring fencing the one thing from the other. Every time I've spoken to leaders from that, uh, that's those circles, I'm made aware of the fact that they know that the relationship they have with the Americans is the best thing that's happened to them since their movement was created. They get it. They get how important it is. They're going to do everything not to, to spoil it, and that's important too. Lastly on this issue, uh, something which I pick up from speaking to, to Syrian Kurds and, uh, and, to, and spending time in Syrian Kurdistan is that there are also frictions between the Kandil leadership and the local people. It's, it's not that the people who are 
politically active or politically significant from Syrian Kurdistan are, are happy about the notion that people are coming down from Kandil and telling them what to do. They don't necessarily like it. There isn't a great deal they can do about it either. And that's something which which is worth watching, you know, the potential friction between the Kurds coming from outside and the Kurds from within. If we think of it from our own experience, what, what, what happened with Palestinians, for example, in the late 80s and 90s when they had these activists coming in from outside and the, the, from Tunis, yeah, in their case, and the tensions that emerged as a result. There's a Kurdish parallel dynamic to that, which is something uh, which is worth uh, watching. Um, with regard to how I do stuff in my own languages, I have a, 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 an advanced, I would say, but not totally fluent level of, of Arabic. So I'm able to uh, get around in Syria and chat to people. But if I'm doing interviews, uh, I would try to take, if it's, an, if it's a simple interview, I could do it. But if it's like with a, a political leader or so, then I would take an interpreter, even though I would probably understand 80% of, of what's being said. The extra 20% would mean that I would want to have an interpreter with me. That's with regard to the Arabic side of things. And, you know, knowing, having at least some level of Arabic is very, is a huge advantage in the sense that, you know, you're not reliant only on official versions or, or, or versions being given to you when somebody's being interviewed. You can chat with people, you can hear things that people are saying to one another, and that's really uh, important. For example, uh, one example, I can think of this when we were in Baghdad once in, uh, in the office of a Badr uh, organization sitting and waiting to, to go to the Beji front. It happened to be, that's not important. There were some officers of Badr in the same room chatting with each other, and one of them uh, said the following. He said, well, they were chatting about the future of Hashtashabi and where it would be heading and so on. One of them said, well, it's very obvious what it's going to be. Just like in Iran, you have the army and the revolutionary guards. So in Iraq, you'll have the army and Hashtashabi, which I thought was a wonderful you know, crystallization of exactly what the agenda is. This guy was just chatting over coffee. That was great. And I'm, I'm very much aware of the fact that when I'm in Kurdish areas, I can't do any of that because I don't know any Kurdish. You know, There, I only hear the official versions. I can't just chat and listen to people. And I think that's something which is very... Uh, very important and notable. Sir? I'm um, uh, Kawa Khadir from uh, K24 for uh, Media and Research. Uh, Turkey uh, revealed a couple times lately that uh, they are preparing for a military attack operation on PKK in Kandil. And especially uh, lately, uh, last week maybe, uh, Mevlut Çavuşoğlu, the Turkey Foreign Affairs Minister, he revealed that and announced that they are going to do that after the election of Iraq and the uh, Afrin's operation. Today, a couple hours ago, just uh, an Iraqi uh, committee of defense member in the Iraqi parliament, uh, Askander Witut, he revealed in an in interview, he said that, yes, that's true, that Iraq and Turkey, they finished, finalized the, la the last points of this agreement, and it will start after the, uh, the elections of Iraq in May, uh, next couple uh, months. So the question is, in such a case, what's the expected response from the United States if this happens? Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, I mean, you know, I think we should still be asking ourselves what the extent of such an attack will be. It's one thing to have a limited operation to, to bomb Kandil. It's another thing for the Turkish army to come up to Kandil to try to destroy the PKK leadership there. If that is indeed what the Turks intend to do, that's, of course, massive. That's, that's, that means the outbreak of an open PKK-Turkish war, which will involve, which will not only be in Kandil. Whereas the, the Turks, I presume, are aware that if they do attempt such a such a, uh, an operation, it means things are going to start exploding in Istanbul and Ankara and, and elsewhere. Uh, and I'm, I wonder if they in fact will, you know, carry, if they're in fact thinking about such an, uh, an operation. But in any case, if they, if they do, uh, from the United States point of view, it's very clear. The United States has a relationship with the Kurdish uh, YPG in northeastern, in Syria, east of the Euphrates, ostensibly just for the war against ISIS. Of course, it's more than the war against ISIS, we know. It's also about maintaining a buffer zone against Iran and so on and so forth. But that's, but that's as far as it goes. Uh, of course, there's no question of a rather broader strategic relationship, and certainly not with, with Kandil. So the answer is that Kandil will uh, have to do its capable best to, to challenge any Turkish uh, emergence into, into the mountains, and it will do so, and I presume it will be very bloody if it happens. But it certainly won't, you know, the PKK will certainly not be you know, calling in U.S. airstrikes, so to speak, the way they were doing against ISIS in the in the Euphrates River Valley. They'll be on their own. But I wonder if Turkey will uh, attempt something as strategic as that. I would tend to be to be skeptical. Erdogan, of course, has elections of his own coming up, and he's in the middle of the olive branch operation. And from what I'm told, nationalist fervor is uh, is at its height in Turkey right now. So maybe it's a good time to be banging the drum about these things without necessarily uh, uh, going going all the way to the end, which is what that would mean. Ambassador? 
from your mouth to God's ear, unfortunately, never quite an ambassador. Oh, sorry. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I the, uh, one t uh, but I appreciate session. the promotion. Thank you very much. <laughs> my, my apologies. Um, sorry. Slightly related, keeping in mind that the Middle East is an area where uh, unsustainable situations can be sustained for half a century and longer. Uh, with regard to the um, uh, this uh, uh, ambiguous Kurdish quasi-American protectorate, whatever it is. Um, how long is it sustainable in your view without it starting to acquire some trappings of sovereignty um, uh, and or independence, uh, even in cooperation or coordination with the, the PKK? And which would be the priorities? Would it be international trade, communications, uh, or the creation of some kind of internal governing structure? Interesting question. So how long is it sustainable? That depends very much on a number of factors which are not under the control of the Syrian Kurds themselves. Firstly, and most obviously, of course, it, it is sustainable for as long as America wants it to be sustainable. That's to say, if the United States wants to stay in the 28% of Syria, which it currently controls, it can do so and, and nothing can, nothing in, in Syria at least can shift it, you know, if, if the Americans want to pay the price. Um, as I think I mentioned or, or noted earlier, uh, there's going to be a price because what the Syrian regime is thinking about, I think, is the notion of some kind of insurgency, of you know, getting going some kind of Arab insurgency inside the that area, and the, and the, the intention will be to make the Americans pay a price to the, so they'll the, they'll leave. Yeah, uh, will it happen or not? I don't know. It'll be an American decision. As long as the Americans want to stay, they can stay. Having said that, how long is it sustainable? Is also dependent to some degree on uh, uh, events not in Syria but rather in Iraq, because if the uh, Iraqi government for example, were to push a little bit further north than they pushed in autumn of last year and close down and take control of Fishkhabur border crossing, then the Syrian Kurdish uh, enclave would be cut off, would be, would be isolated. Um, is that going to happen? I don't think it will happen. I understand that the Americans are very keen to prevent it from happening. If I'm not mistaken, the Iraqi army was heading in that direction last autumn and they were, they were persuaded not to go any further because of very clear American expression of opinion in that regard. But if such a thing were to happen, if, if KRG, so to speak, falls, I mean, it won't fall, but if, if KRG, you know, ceases to really be a Kurdish autonomous area in Iraq in the, in the months or years ahead, that will have enormous implications for the Syrian Kurdish area because it would then be, be cut off. I don't think that will happen. For long as that doesn't happen and America wants to stay, this thing is sustainable. Now, the second question which you asked was, what does that mean? Okay, if it's sustainable, does that mean it will sort of, in a way, go down the direction that the KRG went and sort of end up, you know, coming sort of banging up against the issue of a declaration of independence or not, and what that what that might mean. Um, first of all, let's let's not forget that KRG was around since whatever it was, 1992, and they only did an independent, a real, proper, you know, serious independence referendum in late uh, 2017. And Syrian Kurdish, Kurdish area, or it's the, the, the entity we're talking about, is you know in, 90, in its own 1992 right now. Do you know what I mean? Like it's very, 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 very early on, and the issues are still ones of survival, not ones of uh, of, of sovereignty. Again, let's just, let's assume, which is what your question sort of uh, asks us to do, that that it does survive and it does things do get better and it and it solidifies itself and it creates institutions. Does sovereignty then come onto the agenda? I tend to think that uh, we're a long, long way away from anything like that. Let's not forget, that, once again, this goes back to the nature of PKK political thinking by contrast to that of KDP, right? I mean, KDP is a Kurdish, is very straightforwardly a Kurdish nationalist organization, which, which the natural objective of is to create a Kurdish state, right? That's what KDP wants to do, and that's what it says it wants to do. It's clear and simple. PKK is something else. I mean, it claims to not want to have, it claims to not be a nationalist organization. It claims to not be a separatist organization. Now, there is a tendency of people to sort of laugh and scoff at that and say, oh, don't be so silly. Of course, they are nationalists, but typically of leftist nationalists, they pretend that they're not nationalists, yeah? But I think one needs to, to complicate that a bit. I mean, I spent, you know, I spend a great deal of time talking to people from around those circles, and I had the experience of when you describe them as nationalists, they get very upset and say, no, 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 we're, we're not nationalists. Don't say that we're ethnic nationalists. KDP are that and, and KDP are idiots and we're something quite different. So the kind of anti-nationalist trend, the, the trend within that movement which says state sovereignty and creation of an ethnic Kurdish state is not what we're about and not what we're trying to do is serious. It's not just window dressing. You know, It's something which is quite deeply felt. And indeed, when you speak to the more sophisticated people from those circles, what they'll tell you is not only are we not nationalists, 
But it's vital for the success of our entity that we should not be nationalist because there's a very large Arabic-speaking population within the area controlled by that authority in eastern Syria, and they want that to be a success. They want that population to be integrated, not to be vulnerable to, you know, to to pressure from the outside to act against the authorities. And for them to be to be that, they have to not be just a Kurdish nationalist organization moving towards Kurdish sovereignty. So my sense is that for all those reasons, firstly, because they're just not anywhere close to being able to consider such things, but secondly, because there's internal uh, uh, elements militating against a move towards the creation of Kurdish ethnic state in East, in, in East Syria, I think we're, you know, we're a long way away from anything like that. And we may well never arrive at that point, even if the entity does survive and continue to flourish. Bilal? Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I'm actually just going to uh, maybe press you more on, on, on the question and maybe elaborate on it a little bit. How does this political vision that you just outlined about um, uh, uh, about the PYD and their view for, of ethnic nationalism reflect on the ground in terms of uh, governance, uh, services, economy, policing, uh, teaching, um, Kurdish, uh, you know, running the schools. I mean, they've been they've been basically self-governing uh, for quite some time now. How does that reflect, and how is it also being perceived uh, by the non-Kurds in this uh, in northern Syria? Thank you. Mm. Um, well, yeah, as you know, I think I mean, with regard to education, so they have created a Kurdish-based uh, uh, curriculum, um, which parents are. But the other, the, the non-Kurdish schools are also still in existence, and many parents prefer to not send their kids to the. Uh, to the, the the system which PYD has created because it doesn't lead it doesn't it doesn't lead up to internationally or even nationally recognised certificates of education. So if you want your kid to go on to university, probably you don't want him or her to be studying in those schools. But they have established a, a Kurdish speaking uh, education uh, system. With regard to the the broader question of governance, well, I think as as you probably know, they've the the PYD have taken great care to try to have an Arab uh, leadership sort of par- at least at least nominally. You know, parallel to their own leadership, so they have two chairpersons of the the, uh, the federation. One of those is uh, is a Kurd, a, a, actually a PKK person, always, and the other is uh, a notable or senior Arab figure. It was what's his name, uh, Hamdi Dahmal Hadi of the Al Shamar tribe, for example, was, was was running up until quite recently. So they take very great care to at least nominally, you know, involve uh, uh, Arabic speakers. And you know, if we think of SDF of the armed forces, uh, then. We see that paralleled also the the, the presence of you know formerly re- rebel uh, elements you know within SDF is something which uh, which the uh, the Kurds try and play up and, and, and mention and even Arabic fighters Arab fighters by the way within YPG itself there are uh, Arabic speakers within YPG and they take special care to uh, to to make sure that you notice them if you're a journalist you know covering these areas within all this I think you can hear there's probably in my voice there's a certain amount of skepticism and this goes back to the earlier question of what's the real power behind the ostensible power in that area and the answer is that you know as in SDF as in civilian institutions the real power behind the ostensible power is 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 Kandil and is Kurdish in nature and that's something which I think you know is going to continue to be a fact and that's something which is probably going to you know, which is going to lead to problems somewhere down the line. If you want to create a representative council in in, in Raqqa City, and you want it, or in Derazor, and you want it to function, you are inevitably, you know, with the best will in the world, so to speak, also from the Kurdish side, you're going to run into problems here because the real ultimate power is going to be in the hands of of the Kurds. This is a fact, and that's something which is going to have to be dealt with, and it will lead to problems. We see in SDF, for example exactly how this works, right? Ostensibly, it's SDF, and ostensibly, there are Arab fighters, and, and American officials, I've noticed, uh, always, without exception, when they mention SDF, not only say there are Arabs, they always say, th- it's a, the sentence you always hear is, actually, it's a majority Arab force, right? This you hear again and again. It's not only that there are also Arabs, it's a majority Arab force. Well, this is very nice. If you actually spend some time around SDF, and not only in terms of who's better organized than who else, you know, that the YPG is a vastly more capable military force than the, frankly, quite terrifyingly incapable and I've spent some time with them I won't mention names of units in case there are members of the units or, or f- supporters in the audience but you know some quite terrifyingly incompetent groups among the rebels who are in SDF compared to the very competent YPG but it's not only a question of military competence it's all a question also a question of the real structure of leadership put it put it this way it's not members of al sanadid or, or you know, or or Jaish al-Thuar, who are calling in American airstrikes for SDF. It's only the Kurds who are doing it. They wouldn't trust the others to do it, and they'd be right not to, because these guys, God knows what would happen if al sanadid militia was calling in airstrikes. But the 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 leadership structure is uh, is very clear, and that's what it tells you. The Kurds are the real thing behind it, and that has implications. Aviva, yeah, okay, 
Um, and, and thanks, Jonathan and Andrew. Um, I wondered if you'd say a little bit more about what, uh, what is happening in the South um, uh, and, and might happen in the South. I mean, you spoke a, a bit about the, the obvious interest the Iran has in extending its positions towards Quneitra, but um, I'm wondering what you, what you think the regime is interested in at present, and, it's, and not only towards the Israeli border, but towards the Jordanian border and uh, Dara and Jebel Druze and so forth. What do you think is happening there, and what you know, what what's going to happen, and and who will be the biggest drivers? Is it largely going to be Iran that wants to uh, uh, push things there, or or uh, the regime as well? So with regard to the regime, look, at Nasib border crossing, obviously, which remains not in control of the regime, this was an important trade hub for the regime prior to the war. The regime would like very much to, recon to take control once again of its borders uh, to Jordan. Um, having said that, this is not a priority for the regime right now. The regime has lots to do before it gets round to concentrating on the southwest. Uh, it has to finish, obviously, eastern Ghouta, which it will finish quite soon. But more importantly than that, it has to think about Idlib and what happens with Idlib. And that's going to take a while, and that's the priority. You know, that's where it wants to, to destroy the rebellion before it can think about the southwest. Once it's done that, yeah, the regime of, absolutely would like to come back to, to take complete control of both Dara and Kunetra provinces. The regime has tried in the past on a number of occasions to do so, notably and interestingly has failed to do so, including with offensives involving Hezbollah, uh, and, and has not made the progress it thought it would make inside Dara province. But yeah, it's, it's going to be wanting to come back there. Um, and at a certain stage, possibly it might even get around to, to doing so. But in the meantime, the Iranians are, are very busy uh, creating their own infrastructure, which not only involves the physical in infrastructure we mentioned before, bases and the rest of it, not only involves uh, foreign proxies, but also in that area of, of Southwest uh, involves the, the attempt to recruit uh, local uh, fi fighters. There is a small uh, Shia population down there in the Southwest. There are certain uh, towns. There's also, of course, Christians and, and Druze uh, villages, and the, and the Iranians are engaged in a notable process of trying to recruit, uh, a notable operation of trying to recruit young people down there, which we're watching and as, as observers, and I'm sure the Israeli system is watching to uh, villages. We could name some of them where there is a presence there of Iranians and of Hezbollah who are you know, in the process of recruiting young guys for these uh, emergent uh, local militias. So I think the most important infrastructure emerging is not that of the regime. The regime is, is there where it's there, but is this new infrastructure independent of regime control or supervision which uh, the Iranians are creating in the southwest. And that's something which we should all be uh, be watching very carefully. And um, with regard to the issue of, uh, you know, which you, you pick up here and there in this issue, which these claims of seeding a Shia population and not allowing Sunnis to return to the area, the sort of triangle between southern Damascus and Dara and, and Kunetra, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I, I try to watch it as carefully as I can. I listen to what everybody's saying about it. One hears different accounts as to as to how real that is. Is that really a serious thing, or is that just some notional thing people are, uh, you know, getting worked up about? And I'm, I'm frankly not quite sure because, unfortunately, you know, you can't go into Southwest Syria and report. You can't really see what's going on there with your own eyes, so it's quite difficult to know. But yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, uh, for those of you who um, we we do, we do not have any copies of the book here today, but I would strongly encourage you um, on a personal basis. Uh, to, to read the book. Um, I think it's extremely insightful. Uh, please join me in thanking John for his insights today. And thanks to all of you for coming out to the Washington Institute. We're always happy to see you here, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Good job, man. Yes, thanks. Likewise. Now, uh, I think it went quite well, yeah? Yeah, I'm sure that... Uh, Syrian.